collecting the data and being in each place. And now I'm in a, I think a better place and that I can invite all of these, all of my humans to share their information together with each other. Yeah. But that involves also them being able to film themselves yeah. or use photo voice or somehow document you know, in ways that, I mean, I have some funding to get them some technology, but it still might not be uniform depending on yeah. the continent that they're in and what the privacy issues are that they face. Yeah. And I was wondering if you had some best practices for yeah. how to advise a group of diverse participants okay. who don't have access to the same, even if they have the same technology, they don't have access to the same internet or the same. Absolutely. And I, and I, yeah. I want to make it as fair as possible so that nobody feels like their contribution is less. Right. Right. Uh, so I'm going to record this because I'll send you the recording so that uh, you have it and maybe others also. So everyone. Thank hears. you. Yeah. So, uh, so as I understand, your group is uh, they are geographically also diverse. They live in different uh, maybe areas and spaces. And, yes, and, and different different classes as well. So folks who are very marginalized and others who are not marginalized at all. Okay, and if I may ask you the topic of your research, maybe something can work along, around, around that. Yeah, for sure. I'm looking at the life cycle of an object. And so okay. it's the humans around the object. So I, I was watching one of your other webinars about um, you know, humans and animals. You answered yes. some questions that were interesting yes. there as well. Yes. Um, and I was just wondering, what is your advice when you have a diverse group of people from yes. different places? Yes. Yeah, what makes it easier for all of them? Okay, and so first of all, is this object that you're looking at, is it unanimous? Is it the same thing that you're trying to observe? So, yeah. Yeah, okay. and, and they, would be, they would be like picking their version of that object, but yeah, it would be, it's, it's the same kind of object, but they might use it very differently. So it's an object okay. that has, they're looking, I'm looking at affordances. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so maybe for example, let's say um, an object, say potato. So potato is a, a vegetable that is used uh, differently across different cultures in their own food and cuisines. Uh, uh, people in Spain make tortilla de patatas. In India, we have alu paratas. And uh, maybe in Canada, you have potato wedges. I, I mean, I'm not sure what was the best thing. So uh, an object is always an objective entity. It's an ob And then, as I understand in your research, you're trying to understand how the symbolic universe of different groups or different cultures revolves around that object and what is the interpretations of that object. So uh, obviously uh, there are uh, possible challenges of technology will be there and uh, that you, we cannot overcome that because you yourself said there would be bandwidth issues or internet issues everywhere. So maybe one thing you can do is how we have something trying to replicate the process of having a gatekeeper but here your gatekeeper will also be your collaborator. So, so, and obviously you'll have to give the gatekeeper instructions that this is what, and it, it would be a very scheduled, very structured thing. You'll have to give him or her instructions and, uh, and but also maybe keep that, uh, uh, how do I say, space or keep that leverage or uh, keep, keep, allow them to document things which, uh, might be useful for your uh, research question, but not necessarily in your structured questions. Okay. So, and because since you will give a set of questions to everyone, four or five number of collaborators you have, you would, uh, they would not deviate much from your structured questions. So, I mean, personally, I don't like structuring uh, in, you know, <laughs> research, but uh, yeah. Yeah, but we are not there because you would frame a question from your thought process, they would frame a question from their thought process. But the benefit here that might be you, the structured questions are as it is coming from your thought process as to what you want to see in your research. However, uh, just add it on uh, letting them take some, ask some extra questions, which is within that framework that you give them is also an added advantage in mean, respective if you use it or not. So that's one option of uh, creating unanimity or some sort, sort of homogeneity across research. And uh, same thing you can do even for the participants if you ask them to do mobile ethnography. 
and is it is there a particular sample size that you're looking for uh, in terms of getting thick thick data? Yeah, I th I think it will be pretty small. Like the people who like with with any of these things, um, and if people encounter frustrations, there will be some some attrition, yes. and I think. I will be very lucky to have a dozen solid people yes. um, participating. Yes. And my, my hope is it'll be multi-phase so that okay. they would be filming themselves or, or mm -hmm. taking photographs of themselves mm -hmm. and then coming together to be able to watch each other's video product mm -hmm. um, or photographs and then sharing, like asking each other questions as well. Right. And I was, I was wondering if you had experience with platforms that might be easier mm -hmm. here in Canada right. and especially in British Columbia, we have like these really high privacy standards. Okay. And so I'll have to go through my ethics committee and get approval. Yes, but I was, yeah. And I would, but I was wondering because I know that uploading different lengths of videos can be hard for folks. Mm -hmm. um, have you had experience with different platforms that are much better than others? Uh, so, um, see, to do to replicate ethnography, I personally feel mobile ethnography is closest to now because then you actually get to see not just the person, the participant, but also the space they are in, how they're interacting with the space. Uh, for example, how students living in hostels uh, interact uh, with the common kitchen, for example. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so uh, that's uh, you would need mobile ethnography for that to happen. However, uh, if we want everyone on the same platform, uh, Zoom Zoom is one alternative. I'm, I'm not sure if Zoom is allowed in your uh, Canada, British Columbia. We we actually got a license for Zoom. I think oh, it has some great. extra security. Great. So yes. Great. What about what about though if they want to? like for uploading their videos like to a platform and I'm, I've never done that where people have been been accessing a platform from different places in the world yes. given different technology. I don't know if, if yes, you have that, advice yeah. on that. Yes, that can happen but then you need to give prior training too because everyone would not be comfortable or used to using uh, such platforms. There's something called as MyroBoard wherein uh, it, I mean I have uh, shared links uh, from directly from YouTube and all you think that is possible and I'm guessing that I do not remember exactly but I, I'm guessing you can upload uh, videos I mean I'm sure about photos can be uploaded but uh, videos uh, I would have to double check because I just suddenly seem to have forgotten if videos can be uploaded directly but I'm 100% I'm sure about the links to be uploaded so yeah so maybe that's also what they can perhaps do is upload the link on YouTube first because I mean I uh, how, and you need to set a time duration they, they cannot and I would suggest that you tell them you set a time duration for them so that they don't uh, you know, get carried away and they, yeah so because if they upload say something just half an hour and uh, and it's just technologically also in many other ways it just becomes very confusing so maybe break them into two minutes five minutes and all and uh, so in that way we are not also not letting them take the reign of the research in their hands you know yes. also we're trying to be nice to them and let them speak but uh, you know that's uh, that's another challenge so that that can be done but then you have to give a prior Miro board training so I'll are you aware about the Miro board or would you want me to just quickly show you sorry am I aware of, uh, am I aware of what sorry Miro M-I-R-O Miro board it's a collaborative no. platform okay it's oh most, no I'm not okay I mean you need to have good you need to have decent internet for that that's the only challenge so I'm hoping these people would have decent internet so So it's an online visual a collaborative platform for research. So I'm just logging in once. Give me one second. So I'm, I'm guessing you can see this. Oh, yes. So, okay, oh, this is this. interesting. Okay, so I just pass this. this is... Okay, so there are different ways. So these things are mostly used in, um, in UX research or market research, but we can use them in anthropological research also. I mean, there is no hard and fast rule to that. 
but let's assume to for the ease of your uh, people for your participants let's assume we have this is the basic uh, board and uh, and it's very simple to understand when you you know log into it yourself and there are here are the options where you can write to it put sticky notes so and then there's an option where you can also upload so yeah i think you can upload the videos photos if i go to my device and so either they can upload it themselves or they can send it across to you the videos and photos and you can upload it so that you know how to upload it how to you know bring the different categories and all so uh, that's easy so this is a little slow so this is one uh, platform where they can and then what you can do simultaneously suppose you made this board you ask for all the data from people and you created this board uh, according to your need and uh, uh, so and then they, later on you can just uh, uh, do a zoom call or whatever works in your end google meets or yeah. something i prefer zoom because i'm i am i am not sure if other platforms allow the space to allow the option to share screens so i prefer zoom so it can be like simultaneous like you have the group of your participants or one participant or two depending and you showing this board so you're talking to them and they are seeing this so in a in a way they are in a space which is kind of similar but also different yeah i'm, I'm I hope that is making sense. I mean, I hope. Uh, it's, yeah, it's fantastic. I didn't know about this. This is wonderful. Yeah, it, it can almost be like their album, their shared yeah, it, scrap. But I, exactly. Album. So I've just uploaded a photo, and uh, and I, I'm guessing a video also can be uploaded. So this is one way. I mean, uh, there are a lot of, and they can just use sticky notes. So see if there's there, there's a sticky note. Just pick anything here. Uh, if i just they can write or you can i mean i would prefer if i mean some personally i feel if they can get the idea how to move around this uh, if then it is best to let these thoughts or pictures or anything come from their end yeah definitely and yeah. so i would be checking in if if they were able to access it on their own i would be checking in to see what that was like so that they weren't always feeling like yeah. it was space that wasn't theirs right absolutely so for example so for one of my uh, recent projects um, this collaborative project so yeah just the only challenge is the internet <laughs> so that's the only challenge so because so we uh, created like nine uh, different themes and uh, wow. yeah so maybe you can do something like this so we were trying to look into the common occurring key themes for uh, with regards to the pandemic uh, across yes. the globe so we create we came up with so we did some interviews and through that we came up with some common themes and then we started filling this up and uh, uh, it was just five about five six of us and uh, so yeah if uh, this is a, this is one option just if you want you can also divide your research into maybe major key themes and then they can put their stuff into it or you can have a, you can just go random and let them uh, stick to the framework and just put wherever they want you know just you don't know something. oh that is fantastic yeah it's yeah. an amazing visual <laughs> yeah so this is one way to do it but uh, i mean i can always help you to understand this better whenever you want to and uh, yeah and uh, you can just train them them the participants or if you're using uh, collaborators for your research them also yeah and yeah. yeah oh that's fantastic this is great <laughs> yeah I, I hope this helps because this is a good way and like how we are chatting communicating through zoom you can uh, do the same with the participants and even better if they can uh, though i'm not maybe not possible all the time they if they can um, how do i say in my first one of the first webinar i asked uh, the people the attendees to put a background of zoom uh, you know just change the background of zoom so maybe it's just playing around visuals you can ask them to change the background of zoom or maybe if you whatever wherever those that object is placed that you're trying to understand maybe sit in a room if possible where that object is placed and where the object has the best possible interaction with them or where they have the best possible interaction with that object and like the space 
that the object is meant for. So, of course, we have to work on television sets. You will maybe some some might sit in the bedroom, some might sit in a living area or study room or wherever they have the television. So, so these are some ways you can play around in uh, in current scenario. Uh, that's fantastic. This, this is exactly the kind of space that's useful. This, um, this board yeah. here. That's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty simple. You uh, can navigate yourself also, and your stuff can always ask me. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you. This is yes. great. Now I just have to make sure that people can access it. Yes, and you have to give them a little bit of tiny bit of a training and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, they should be uh, maybe comfortable with technology because lots of you, if you targeting people, are, you know, like our parents probably, they might have a little difficult time. I mean, uh, to navigate it. So uh, there are some challenges, but yeah, yes, this is one of the options we can use. But it would be possible even um, to work with somebody over Zoom on training them how to use that too, absolutely. right? Yes, ab absolutely. Uh, yeah. if once you uh, understand how to navigate it, how to use it, and uh, uh, you've explored your necessary options and all, and uh, you can always uh, create a pre-training of sorts for your participants and tell them that uh, uh, this is what uh, you can do and this is how you can upload and write stuff and it's pretty simple and uh, um, but then I would only suggest and it's purely because of uh, technology I, I it's uh, it's best to have around as from my experience it's best to have not more than seven to eight people on or maybe nine people maximum nine ten people uh, on this board otherwise it just slows down so that's the only challenge no, that's uh, that's actually good. That caters to a smaller group. So yes, so yeah, so you can make maybe batches or sets of people. Uh, so and however you want to mix them, uh, you want to create a diverse diversity, or you want to have one set of people together and then second set of people. So it's not only your call how how it best fits for your research mission. So this is this. Oh, <laughs> That's fantastic. You have answered my questions and then some. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Most, most welcome. Uh, what else? Uh, you can also try with mobile ethnography. That also works. Yeah. Yeah. Mobile have, have you ever, um, like I know that some of the advice that you were giving people in the sort of question and answer period for one of the webinars that I saw, it sounded like you have um, had different kinds of scenarios and different kinds of interactions with folks. Have you ever done um, like a, a visual duo ethnography, like paired any of your research participants so that they were creating something together um, and, and learning from each other? Like I'm really interested in the ideas of, of co-creations that can happen. Like not, I really like that it's not just the researcher presenting the research that the group can actually learn or pairs of people can learn more um, deeply about each other. Mm -hmm. So I have personally not done that because my, my work so far in, uh, speaking practically has al always been amongst the indigenous or folk communities. So yeah, but, but, but then uh, and uh, over time I do have an interest in uh, digital ways of doing ethnography also but uh, so but then you're answering your questions I've not done that but that certainly there's a possibility that can be done but in so let's let's assume it's a video call two people are having and they are in that but you have to give them the instructions eventually yes. yeah you uh, yes. they, yeah so you give them the instructions that this is what uh, let's assume you your, your research question is uh, on the online dating, as we call the term these days, pan dating, dating the pandemic. So you want to understand how uh, heterosexual couples or homosexual couples or any uh, how do they interact with each other or different uh, 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 different castes or different uh, different culture. How do they interact? And maybe what you can tell them is to uh, obviously you can you have to then observe their They'll have a Zoom background. I mean, like like how you have, like you have. I can see you have certain books and certain <laughs> pictures. I, I probably I can say I I'm not. It's not very clear, but they look like 
I mean, nature pictures or something. On, on the yes. Oh, yeah. you have good eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, uh, and let's assume I also had similar pictures in the background. And so, which probably can give us some bit of a notion that we, this couple, they are both nature lovers. So, you know, such things and, uh, and if it matters, does it suit your research question or not? And so, um, so beyond their interaction as a couple, we and, and they also, uh, we have to see their behaviors, their body language, their expressions. Are they comfortable talking to each other online? Are they comfortable dating online? And uh, what is their, individually, what is their comfort space? Like, you're in your study room, I'm in my bedroom. If hypothetically, if I had to sit in my, in my kitchen where my, uh, my other family members also can ex enter, I may not be a very comfortable position. So yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. So those, those are ways. So yes, uh, 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 interactions between two people is definitely possible. Or uh, if you want to do a mobile ethnography, uh, that's also possible in a way that, uh, uh, again, this also becomes mobile ethnography because I think WhatsApp and all also has tools for video calling so they can use mobiles. Yes. 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 They're absent on Zoom. And the pet, I would rather prefer or suggest uh, uh, mobile ethnography because there the participant has the option of moving around the space or the house. So. So it's like getting to know one each of their moods, how they're moving around the space, what they are doing, and you understand. You also understand what is the relation or interaction they have make them so comfortable or not so comfortable with the person they're talking to. Yeah, yeah. and that really allows them agency over yes. what they're showing as well. Yes, yeah, I like that. Yes, yes, abs absolutely. Maybe there are questions. So what they're doing might be within your framework and uh, but but it, it's it's uh, it's going to be more unstructured because you just told them i'm looking into this aspect i'm looking trying to understand uh, this question this, this is my hypothesis and this is the theory that i'm trying to find out and then they, they can talk about anything that they want and so yeah that's uh, that's some one way to navigate yeah, and I like that because I've I've found in the limited amount of research I've done that I've had these notions of what will happen and then better things happen that I didn't expect yeah. when people yes. have the freedom to, to do that. Yes, yes, absolutely. So mobile is, is the easy way. Again, technology is an issue. That's the only thing, but uh, yeah. we can't do much about it. And uh, yeah, that's, I think, uh, what else can you do? So these are the major two things that you can do and uh, um, what else can be done uh, mobile ethnography and mobile ethnography can be uh, can, it's not necessarily just two people but it can be more than two people like say group of friends three four friends and how to study together and uh, something like that and uh, uh, yeah these, these are the two most uh, common ways most that uh, can use and uh, maybe, uh, but then in that, I mean, I, I maybe live sessions, but in that, you will just get to know the concerns or the questions people ask. Uh, you can't really see more in detail, so that's yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you yeah. do you see this virtual moment? I mean, it COVID is awful, yeah. <laughs> But using this technology, it's going to shift how we do ethnography. Like Absolutely. it will allow different, I mean, I wonder if it will give research participants more agency by virtue of what we are needing to, to have them do with us. Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, uh, normally so far, we had the option of taking the things in our hands and having that commands whenever we wanted, even if it was to derail. But here, it's all about collaborative ethnography. You have yeah. to collaborate with the gatekeepers, other, mem others, other uh, stakeholders. So there are multiple stakeholders now, to be, to be precise. So it's not just the researcher and the, and the participant. And the only challenge perhaps I would feel here is uh, regards to spontaneity because you can have ref reflexivity but yes. uh, the spontaneity like the feel like for example so my work is most has so far 
majorly uh, has been gorilla research. So where it, you know, there's a lot of option of spontaneity, even if yes, we have to be reflexive. So, but that spontaneity, I personally, to be honest, I do find it missing in these uh, tools. And the maybe the only way is that, but then yes, tools like mobile ethnography, uh, you, there can be some bit of spontaneity. And uh, once uh, that, that, I mean, if you allow the participants uh, that comfort zone, that space to be what they want to be, who they are, and move around the way they want to be. So that's the that's the one challenge, biggest challenge I find, which has spontaneity. I think I think that partly mirror, the 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 mural board allows a little bit of that icebreaker, yeah, um, to happen, but I. I also see like in the spontaneity, there's something that even though it's not my job as a researcher to be curating somebody else's experience, when I've done work alongs with people in the past in their mobile work, I've had access to observing much more of that space. Whereas now I will be limited to what it is that they wish to show me, but then maybe that's how it should be anyway. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think it should be that way. I mean, uh, you have the, the data has to, the information has to come from the people that you're talking to or you're trying to, you're trying to focus on. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, but from my, I, but I also feel that uh, some you, you still need to create a framework. And uh, if your the answer does not match or make sense or add value or uh, give you a food for thought, for your research questions, I would not know if it would be right to include it or not. And uh, yeah, so uh, maybe for example, if you're researching on potatoes, I can accept some talking about sweet potatoes. That's okay. That's something. Or maybe other uh, tuber vegetables, root vegetables, and all. But if someone suddenly decides to talk about ladyfinger or cauliflower, then I, I mean, and this is a very uh, silly example, yeah. but then, yeah, but then it would just be, you know, although there are vegetables and they're maybe in consumption, but uh, I would not uh, give, I mean, I would not consider it as a uh, primary source of information. Yeah, I mean, it's, you're keeping yeah. it to your topic area, yeah. Yeah, I'm keeping it like very, uh, or too restricted. I'm giving it enough space to breathe so that I have some interesting information popping out, uh, maybe the, but uh, but my first focus will be on the first impressions that come. And uh, uh, when I say first, when I say first uh, impression, I basically mean the first thing that the participant says, we do this with the potatoes. No, we don't make potato chips. We make sweet potato chips, uh, hub soil. Right. So, yeah. And but I will keep the other information that is not so relevant uh, for my research. I will certainly keep it into account because we cannot also ignore the participants or the people who have no interaction with the with the product or with with the object that we're focusing on. Uh, maybe that is. We will, it's just a filtration process for us to understand that, okay, why don't they use, why does this person eat potatoes or sweet potatoes? Maybe they have some health issue. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So. And um, then that almost becomes like the, the visual version of the marginalia that yeah, you get when yeah. you do surveys and things. Yeah. Okay. Right. right absolutely. Like your, your case, you said that there are a set of people who are very marginalized and then there is an yes. opposite set of people. So maybe. A uh, certain group of people will not have so much of interaction with the object that you're focusing on, and some other group will have a lot of interaction. Maybe yes. reasons can be cultural, social. I mean, I'm not sure if they can be biological reasons or uh, not to not use that object. Yeah, there, there could actually even just in terms of ableism. Yes, yes, that's about, what I mean. Yeah, 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 for sure. I didn't think about that. Yeah, yeah, or maybe psych psychological uh, reasons to not use a certain. Uh, object and uh, uh, for 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 example, uh, there are a lot of couples uh, like say okay, use of condoms is promoted in every society, say for safe sex. But uh, then uh, I've I've heard come across a lot of couples. I heard a lot of lot of people that they don't like using condoms or contraceptive pills or basically condoms. Uh, so. 
to because they feel that it sort of reduces or decreases the intimacy. Yeah. So, uh, so which is a reason which is psychological, emotional, biological also. So yeah, yeah that's just one example and. Um, yeah, that's interesting to be looking for the reasons that yeah. people, not just how, who is having more contact and why, but why yeah. that why? contact is different. Yeah, why this? Why mm -hmm. it is not the way that we, and that will obviously give you a reflexivity and uh, yeah. Uh, that's fantastic. You have been an immense help. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. I hope I was able to answer your questions. I mean, At, and then some, uh, and then some. I think you've you've already resolved some problems that I was going to stumble on very shortly, and you've answered them for me as well. So thank you so much. Most 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 welcome. Uh, you can ask more questions if you. I mean, it's just two of us right now. So if you have anything else, please. So yeah. <laughs> Then, then I, I'm curious. I'm so surprised it's not a room full of people because it's so rare to have this opportunity that you yeah. put yourself out there and said, and there are three yes. sessions. Yes, I, abs absolutely. But it's okay. So it was your your need was probably more, and as compared to others, yeah. So, but well, I'm, I I'm curious. I, I would be curious if I could ask one more thing, and this sure. is more about in sure, your research sure. experience. Yes. What is the one piece of advice that you wish you had had when you started doing visual ethnography and that it, you had to learn from experience and you thought, oh my goodness, if only I'd known this one thing. Yes, yes. So I am non-anthropologist uh, by training. So it's all uh, self-taught and, you know, I started directly with field work uh, where, because I thought that's probably one of the best ways for me to learn because eventually if I can't, uh, you know, uh, imply my learning on the field, it would not do me any good. So, uh, so my training is in MBA, Muscle Business, Business Administration, uh, with specialization in uh, hospitality. So culture has always been a part of my life since uh, many years. So, but I think if somebody would have told me uh, in the beginning uh, about um, uh, cognitive biases, because I feel like uh, that is a big, a very big challenge. The research is very field phase. It's not always easy to overcome it uh, because it's your your thoughts, your mind, your experiences. Uh, they will you will always think from that perspective. But then, if somebody would have given me some tips, like I'm now doing a course on cognitive behavioral therapy, an online learning course on Udemy. So I know as I'm learning it, as I'm reading it, then I'm trying to reflect back of okay, what I did. So suddenly I'm realizing, I mean, I just feel maybe it's just me doing things out of proportion, but I feel I've been, there are times that I've been, uh, 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 how do I say, uh, very biased uh, and wanting to just ask those questions for which answer that I was looking for, not being yes. open to, not being open to people answering from their perspective to my questions. So, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, that's one thing was if somebody would have told me how to uh, create those spaces, those moments where in uh, there is, there's less of bias. Is it possible and that, or not? Yeah. And that's when those interesting comments get made, when those interesting yes. observations that you were totally not expecting slip in. Yes. Yes, yeah. abs 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 absolutely. Like for example, in bias, we have something called as uh, se uh, sensory, sensory bias and uh, sensory assumption bias, and uh, uh, which means that we think the first information is the first impression. We're not ready to go beyond that. And then uh, with regards to that impression, our, our memories automatically, whatever the first thought comes to our mind, the first image or word or object comes to our mind, we think, okay, we are done. That's the answer. But are we ready to look a little beyond that? Are we ready to introspect? Ask the person, okay, why not this? But why this? Why? Oh, yeah. Why do you, you do something? Why don't you do the other thing? So, so, yeah, this is one thing. And I just feel, I personally, honestly, I feel bias is a very ignored topic in research, cognitive biases. 
Yeah, and I, th and I think that's the reason. It's really interesting because the, I think the need to go back and re-interview the same people or have further conversations, I was so surprised when I presented some of my initial findings to the yes. participants who had worked with yes. me. And some of them looked at me and they were like, where did you get that from? Like, what, what were you thinking? And, and, and they were like, well, I, I can see how you might understand that, but this is the reality. And it yeah. was completely different than what I had assumed. Yes, ab absolutely. That can, that can happen. And uh, so that, that's why even when, when you do visual ethnography or visual anthropology, we have to be very careful because uh, camera can uh, create a lot of biases. And as uh, I think I mentioned in one of my uh, previous lessons also that uh, camera can make people talk a lot, over dramatize or be very uh, shy of expressing. And then uh, that will create a bias for us and maybe that will create a bias for them. So uh, we have to be very, it's a, it's a very uh, uh, slippery scope, a uh, slippery slope. So yeah, so just have to be and per Perhaps that comes with, like, for those of us who are lucky enough, perhaps, to have several months yeah. of being able to have repeated um, yeah. meetings, um, encounters, um, yes. focus groups with people. Yes. But yes. They become more accustomed to that space and less aware of the camera and less yes. aware of being performers. Yes, yes. absolutely. It comes with time. But then still, I would uh, uh, say here that if some, someone was doing an ethnography or research without visual tool or visual tools, they would have a more challenge in breaking that bias or understanding or in, in incorporating reflexivity in their research because a, a visual medium, a visual it encompasses or includes more than one information. So maybe your person is saying something else, but their body language expression is not matching. And maybe they're saying those things because they are in a space. For example, I was, I, there was a, for my, one of my researches, my last projects on one of the indigenous groups in India. So we, uh, unfortunately it's easy to in, in, interview men, uh, when, but it is a, always a challenge to interview, to get the voice of women in research, especially in such communities, indigenous communities. So I spent almost, I think, 20, 15, 20 minutes trying my best to a half an hour almost trying for her, my best for her to give share her thoughts about what she thinks about certain practices that I was trying to uh, get answers for and uh, what does she think about life. You know, what, I mean, just her thoughts and uh, but she did not answer and and I kept thinking what was I doing? And then I realized maybe the space wasn't correct because there were other people around her. Maybe I didn't create that space. Maybe I was uh, assuming it was my bias to assume just because, uh, and, and she was one of the leaders of that group. So and just because I assumed that she's a leader, she would be able to speak very comfortably. And uh, so she didn't answer anything. I mean, all she did was in the end, she sang a song that belonged to that group community. So that's it. So, so we have to understand a person may be more comfortable in a different space and may not be so comfortable in another space. And so and how, what are the people around, around you and around them? All these things eventually matter. And so that's really interesting too, in terms of like thinking temporally, that making sure that there are meetings at different times of day because people mm -hmm. might be at different times of day in a more comfortable environment for them. So in a group, maybe you'll hit better times for people. Yes. Yes. It, it was an experimentation. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So if you like, if you want to uh, talk about interview or speak to moms and. Uh, you can't uh, get, they might talk to you and you, you'll get different answers and interesting answers, but uh, to, you know, deep dive into their mental thought, thought process and their emotions, deep, I mean, to understand what they're actually feeling, you probably will have to catch them at a time when they're not uh, making breakfast or if they're housewives especially or not running away to, get to their workplace or uh, yeah. Yeah, not engaging with their children. So they're different. I mean, I personally feel time and space can change drastically even if the set question is same across in, in, within 24 hours. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, well, I can't thank you enough. So thank this you. has been wonderful. Great. I'm glad I could help you. And I hope it just value adds to your research. Oh, definitely. <laughs> this has been wonderful. Thank you so very much. Awesome. And I 
we'll continue following your webinars on YouTube. Most, most welcome. So I will just uh, send you the recording and I'll email you and uh, great. So um, if you this have any comments, great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so very much. And Thank I hope you have busier sessions for your next two sessions. I, I don't mind if one person comes or 10 people come. I, my job is to answer. So yes so. well i feel very spoiled and very fortunate so thank you so very much and awesome. yeah have a awesome. have a good rest of your of your sessions great thank you thank you and if, if i may just ask you if you're on uh, linkedin or facebook can you just give me a shout out so that uh, because uh, i mean although i don't charge anything but then i would really want to promote visual ethnography as pra as a practice in the research community because it's not i will yeah. I'm not a very good, are you, are you also a Twitter person? I'm better at Twitter than I am at the others. Um, whatever works for you. I mean, I'm not really, I don't really use Twitter. So yeah, whatever works <laughs> but for I you. Can, so. But I can refer people to your YouTube channel um, via Twitter. Anything, okay, whichever. We'll do that. It's just to increase the outreach. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Have a great day ahead. Yeah, bye. You as well. Take care. Yeah, bye.